episode of Voice of the Sea. We're talking about the progress and the plans to help save the Kiwi Q. A critically endangered Maui forest bird that eats insects from the bark of native Hawaiian trees like koa and ohia. The Maui Forest Bird Recovery Project has led a decade-long effort with multiple partners to regrow native forest, breed the kiwi kiu in captivity, and reestablish a wild population of kiwi kiu in the newly grown forest of Nakula. In October 2019, biologists attempted to relocate 13 kiwi kiu to Nakula. The birds took well to the new habitat, but the move was unsuccessful because of avian malaria, which is transmitted by non-native introduced mosquitoes. Experts are now reinvigorating their work to reduce threats facing the kiwi kiu and ensure its future, including mosquito control plans that could save not only the kiwi kiu, but also many other native forest birds, which are threatened by invasive species, disease, and climate change. We start off talking with Chris Warren outside his office in upcountry Maui. For Kiwi Q, we, we knew that they used to exist on that slope. And we also knew that their current range, which, was, which is fairly small, was likely shrinking. And they're somewhat unique in that each individual pair, individual bird, needs a lot of area. So you can fit hundreds of, of some other species in the same area as one kiwi kiu pair. There's a couple different ways you can release birds. There's a soft release and a hard release. Hard release is you catch them, you move them, you let them go. It sounds harsh, but it actually has very high success rate with a lot of species. What we did was called a soft release, where you hold them for a certain period of time at the release site. We mainly did that because we, we were blending captive and wild birds together. So the general consensus is a soft release is better for captive individuals and a hard release for wild individuals. Because we were blending both the captive and the wild, we had these open air aviaries made of PVC and wire mesh out in Nakula. And so when we grabbed the birds, from their captive facility and then move them. We put them in the aviaries and they stayed there for a week before the wild birds moved over. It was fascinating to watch where they went. You know, right out of the cage, just, it's like they just explore the world with their mouth. It's a bit like a puppy or something. They land on something, <laughs> can I bite this? You know, the translocated birds had not seen koa probably in their whole life and even those birds just instantly went to koa they were going to large trees with flaking bark and removing that flaking bark they were targeting dead sections of branches unbeknownst to us at the time the very day that we moved the wild birds over the first captive bird showed some signs of illness what are the signs that they show when they're starting to get sick from malaria? You know, it's, it's not unlike any of us when we get ill. You just, you stop moving a little bit more, kind of slump down, maybe eat a little bit less. What was very striking to us is the, the in the laboratory studies, they, they, they mostly died of anemia and organ failure. Uh, like systemic or organ failure. What we saw was they seemed like they were a little ill and they were dead that night. And so the first bird, he actually, he showed, he was a little ill and they had time to actually fly him back to the captive facility and he died shortly after. And that happened with a couple birds. We successfully evacuated a couple birds that started to show illness only for them to die before they could receive treatment. There was one bird that never showed signs of illness in Nakula, but he, he was a captive bird that he was moved back to the facility 
and started to show symptoms there and they successfully treated him and he is he's doing well now. We moved captive birds to Nakula that it's very unlikely that they had gotten bit before they moved to Nakula. So the birds that moved to Nakula that wound up dying of malaria, they almost undoubtedly got it there. And then we moved birds from very high elevation in Hanavi, where we have always thought they're safe from disease. We moved them to Nakula and then they died of malaria. And so it seemed, well, they, they contracted it in Nakula. So we had an idea of how many mosquitoes were in Nakula prior to this whole thing. And then after we lost the birds to malaria, we tried to trap mosquitoes again. And we found this crazy high number of mosquitoes. So obviously something had changed, but we had actually taken blood samples from the birds in Hanavi before we moved them. It, the story seemed so coherent. It wasn't a very high priority, but we, we did it anyway. And then they all came back positive for malaria before the move. We were like, well, that can't be right. You know, we actually asked them to, to test it again. And it, same thing. So as far as we know, every bird we moved from Hanavi already was infected with malaria. We don't know if the move caused the parasites in their blood to reproduce and then go through the whole infectious cycle and they would become acutely infected. Or if they got bit again in Nakula and died from that infection, I, I, don't, I don't think we're ever gonna know. We had this very simplistic view of malaria in QBQ before that basically we think that they probably can't survive malaria because they're mostly only found above 4,800 feet and then we started actually testing more and more birds and finding more and more positive malaria samples from other species at pretty high elevation. And then we started trapping for mosquitoes and finding them higher and higher. And everything we, we look at makes the story for the wild birds that much more dire. The disease landscape, as we call it, is changing really fast and our ability to track that change is limited. Some of the high elevations of where they are now, there's this transmission could be seasonal. That might be the best we can hope for at this point for the birds in the wild. We learned a lot during this translocation. Yes, it's risky, certainly was risky to the individuals um, and we lost those birds. That is heartbreaking but we had to do something, and we still have to do something. The University of Hawaii Sea Grant College Program, focused on Hawaii's coasts and its communities, through sustainable development, safe seafood supply, sustainable coastal tourism, hazard resilience, and healthy coastal ecosystems. Hawaii's Sea Grant. Welcome back. We're talking about extinction and how much time is left for the Kiwi Q, as well as possible next steps to save this amazing forest bird with Dr. Hannah Mounts. Kiwi Q are the most endangered bird on Maui. And we know there's less than 300. Our point estimate for their population right now is around 157 individuals. We know that this habitat area that we're in is possibly not the best place for them to thrive. We get a lot of rain, we get a lot of wind, high elevation, pretty, pretty challenging climate. I think the most interesting thing about them is they are the most specialized of the honey creepers that we have left. So when you look at what goes extinct, you lose the highest specializations first. 
they have the most obscure life history. But the fact that they stay together in a pair year round, weird. The fact that they lay one egg, weird. The fact that their chick stays with them for up to 18 months, not a typical songbird. They're filling this niche sort of like a woodpecker wood on the mainland. Nakula Natural Area Reserve was it was established, I think around 2010, but it was fenced and the large animals were taken out in 2012. And that was really when the forest restoration started. With all the partners included, were over 250,000 trees that have been put in Akula so far. And that first area that we're working in is kind of like the core for both the forest and the birds to move out from. And then the forest outside of Nakula is being slated for restoration as well. There's state agencies, um, watershed partnerships that are all working to the east and west of us and planting. And so if we can get a small population established in the middle, then they'll be able to seed those other areas in the future. We also need people to plant native species in the mid-elevation area, just where people live. Most of what you see in people's yards is non-native. As we start tackling the disease issue and the birds want to move down, there isn't currently habitat for them. Any way that people can help, whether it's time or money or awareness or writing letters, you know, it's all helpful. A lot of people say, you know, you have a koi koi out here that have less than 3,000, like what are we doing about them? But we only have six native forest birds left out here. So all, even though all of these recovery actions are focused on KiwiQ because they're the most endangered, they're gonna benefit the other species too. But it's also just gonna benefit ecosystem function and you know the watershed function and all of that that also benefits humans. We put a value on protecting biodiversity. Not everybody has that value. And you can't always convince people to have that value. If you don't care about birds and you don't care about biodiversity and I can't convince you of that, that's fine, but you still use water. So we need to protect these high elevation areas. We need to reforest them. We need to get them back to the forest function that they were before because that's also providing all the water that we're using downslope. And one thing that was really positive last fall is we actually had uh, EEV show up in Nakula on its own. It's like, you know, build it and they will come. He was <laughs> suddenly like, hey, there's this great forest here and he showed up on his own. So that was really great. Can you, we revisit this idea of like how many do we think is in the population of KiwiQ now? And what is the extinction timeline that you guys are operating under to establish these priorities? Everyone is in agreement that, that, that they are declining. Everybody is, you know, also in agreement that the best population estimate we have is around 150 individuals. We've got as few as three years, maybe as many as 10. Some people optimistically might say 15 or 20, but at that point, if you only have a handful of individuals left, would you actually be able to recover them from those numbers? Unlikely. And so what are some of the actions that you're looking at taking in the next three to five years? Unfortunately, putting those birds in captivity right now is the most sure option we have to protect them against, you know, extinction where they are in the wild. What the working group would like to do is establish some new sites. These will most likely be on the mainland with two mainland zoo facilities that we are talking with that will be able to hold a larger number of birds for us and hopefully breed them. But if they don't breed them, because we know of the challenges that these birds have had in captivity thus far, at least those birds would be in a place where they are protected and still around. These birds are pretty long lived. So say we can hold them in captivity for a handful of years, like three to five years, while we get some of these other landscape level techniques out there to protect the birds. What is landscape level disease control? Landscape level means something that is actually going to make a difference range wide. You know, we could say trap mosquitoes in at one point, but then what is preventing those other mosquitoes from coming in and affecting the birds in that area? Hawaii is pursuing an incompatible insect technique, need to slow the spread of disease. We need to ensure that there are areas, you know, on all the islands that are safe from this disease risk. If say we hit a lot of roadblocks and we can't actually get the disease risk to a acceptable level on Maui, start thinking about are there other areas within Hawaii that are still safer from disease that would be suitable?
The critically endangered forest birds on the Big Island do not seem to be declining as quickly as Kiwi Q. They have more higher elevation forest habitat on the Big Island than we do here. So we would presume they have some areas that have a lower disease risk over there, but we would have to actually you know, check and make sure that that is true. And I mean, research on the overlapping competition between other natives and all of this, at least starting those mosquito and disease surveys and starting looking at areas as possibilities is something that we have to start now. We are looking for a few heroes, mentors, trailblazers, innovators a passion to change lives, spark curiosity, open hearts, and awaken minds, help students answer the question, who am I? This could be your calling, but this is no job. It's the journey of a lifetime. Be a hero. Be a teacher. Welcome back. We're with Taya Penniman, learning about avian malaria and the plan to fight it in Hawaii's high forest. Does avian malaria affect the, our seabirds and lower elevation birds as well as the forest birds? It doesn't appear to affect our seabirds, which, which doesn't mean that they don't have it. It's different bird species can be carriers of it, but they don't have a negative reaction to it. And we're even seeing that with some of our forest birds, for example, the amakihi, we're starting to see that species appear in lower elevation, which indicates that it's starting to develop an immunity to it. In contrast, some of the other species, such as the eevee, is highly susceptible. A single bite can kill an individual. And are there any concerns about removing the mosquitoes from the ecosystem? Are they playing any kind of valuable role that will be missed? There are no native mosquitoes in Hawaii. Biologists who've looked at the issue do not consider them to be an essential element of our, of our environment. It's unlikely that we're going to eradicate mosquitoes from Hawaii, and we're also, we're only going after one particular species. There are five or six different species in, in Hawaii right now. The mosquito of concern is Culix quinquefasciatus, and yes, it can be also a carrier of diseases that affect humans, such as West Nile virus, which we don't have in Hawaii, but we could get it equine encephalitis, so it could affect horses. Its common name is the southern house mosquito. Gotcha. That gives you a clue that yes, it most definitely bites humans. This project definitely has potential applications for addressing human health issues that are caused by mosquitoes. And the, Depart the Hawaii Department of Health is actually a member of our steering committee, and they are already looking at the possibility of using this same technique to address some of the issues that we have here in Hawaii, such as dengue is one that certainly comes to mind. We're talking about the ability to save many different species. We have up to 12 species that are likely to go extinct in, by the turn of the century if we don't address this. I think this work is one of the most pressing conservation issues we face in, in Hawaii right now. These species, such as the KBQ, will blink out in perhaps three to five years, 10 years, if we don't do something now. For people who are watching this who want to be involved or want to help, is there anything that members of our community can do? For people who want to support this work, one is to educate themselves about it. When it comes before the public to weigh in, public engagement community support is going to be very important. And I would also encourage people to really get much more familiar with our forest birds. It's a challenge because they're in these upper elevation forests that many people don't get to. So reach out to whether it's your Nature Conservancy, your forest bird program to find out how you can learn more about these birds, why they are an important part of our ecosystem and also our Hawaiian culture because they are very deeply embedded in the Hawaiian culture. 
キビキウキウキウキビキウエヌキビアキマウポーハナヌエアエメイアノホイコハキビキウキウキウオキビキウ Your stout curved bill is always snapping <laughs> Approach and occupy your perch Here is a thriving bird and may you thrive indeed <laughs> And the skill at peeling back the bark is seen. It's the nipping amidst the twigs、um, of my sweet little kiwiku bird.、Uh, we present now、um, our hula. <laughs> Next, Dr. Floyd Reed explains his work with mosquitoes and the Wolbachia bacteria. Which he hopes will help combat avian malaria in Hawaii. We have Kulex mosquitoes that we're raising. We've collected these here on Oahu, and we're trying to clear a bacteria that lives inside the mosquitoes.、Uh, it's symbiotic bacteria, and replace it with another one from fruit flies.、It、makes them incompatible, so they can't have offspring that survive. And this is a way to suppress the wild population of mosquitoes. The bacteria that we're injecting is already here in Hawaii, so we're not bringing anything new there as well.、So、we're doing this with antibiotics and micro injection of the new bacteria into the mosquitoes. Here are some Kulex larvae, mosquito larvae, and these have been exposed to tetracycline to try to clear out the Wolbachia, the bacteria that normally infects them. Here's slightly older larvae, and they're larger down here, and these are even older larvae. That are starting to form pupa. So I call them tumblers. And the pupa, let's get them to move around there, they will close into adults fairly soon. Over here, there's a lot more larvae in this tray.、Um, these are larvae that have not been exposed to tetracycline, that have their own endogenous Wolbachia, their own bacteria. We're going to try to cross these together as adults and see if we can stop them from producing offspring. Despite the challenges, there is hope for the Kiwi Q and Hawaii's other forest birds. Creating another population of Kiwi Q has been a project that's over 20 years in the making. It was amazing just like seeing the first one that we released. He immediately flew into a koa, and it was just something that we had all had dreamed about was seeing Kiwi Q in a kula in a koa tree. It's a unique part of the Earth's biodiversity. It's the only one of its kind. It's also just a cool bird. It's a small bird with a massive bill. But it's part of this entire ecosystem that if we lose it, the ecosystem is less. And we've already lost so many of Hawaii's birds, roughly two thirds. And so what we're left with is a small fraction of the original, just incredible biodiversity that was here. And the same goes for we've lost a lot of other plants and insects. Hawaii is just really the extinction capital of the world. We've lost so many of our species. And so saving every one that remains is just critically important. We can save Kiwi Q, and we can save a Koei Kilaro Mallard, we can save the honey creepers on. Hawaii and the Big Island, but the time is now. We need to, we have to act now. Learn more at voiceofthesea.org. Follow us online at Voice of the Sea TV. Mahalo for watching Voice of the Sea. Exploring Our Fluid Earth is the dynamic curriculum developed by the University of Hawaii's Curriculum Research and Development Group. The award winning Fluid Earth and Living Ocean textbooks are now interactive and online. New activities, updated content, and a teacher community. Exploring Our Fluid Earth is now freely available. Find out more at exploringourfluidearth.org.